Good evening to everyone. I welcome all of you tonight as we join together as a family of believers to worship our Lord and to be strengthened in our faith in Him through word and sacrament. And tonight I pose to you a question. And that is, how do you overcome evil and wickedness? The answer is by love, goodness, kindness, compassion, patience, forgiveness. As we shall see from our scriptures this evening. And with that, we'll begin our service tonight in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I now like to have you turn to page 154 in the front part of your hymnal, page 154. We are going to follow private confession. And again, you join me where uh, the print is in the bold. In the name of our God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no secrets are hidden, Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer, listen to my cry for mercy, and in your faithfulness come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. Answer me quickly, O Lord, my spirit fails. Do not hide your face from me, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me, and am deeply sorry for them. And we'll just take a few moments for our own private confession. Jesus says to his people, If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Yes, I believe. Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you for all of your sins and be assured that you are dear children of God and heirs of eternal life. O oh Lord my God, I call to you for help, and you answer me. I thank you for the love you have shown me in Jesus Christ my Savior. Through him you have rescued me from the guilt of my sin, and given me the peace of forgiveness. Help me fight against temptation, Correct whatever wrongs I can, and serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go in peace, and the Lord be with you. And we pray. O Lord Jesus Christ, preserve the congregation of believers with your never-failing mercy. 
Help us avoid whatever is wicked and harmful, and guide us in the way that leads to our salvation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our scripture lesson for this evening is recorded in the book of Jeremiah the prophet, chapter 15, beginning with the 15th verse. Jeremiah was called by God to be a prophet already in the womb of his mother. And in time he became that prophet, and he loved going out sharing the word of God with others. Now he was being persecuted. And he felt that this was totally unfair, that this shouldn't happen. He became angry and upset with God, just like we do at times, for the way he, he made treat us. And God comes back to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, and he does this in love and compassion. He says, repent. And when you do, I will help you to speak faithful words. I will watch over you, protect you, so that they don't overcome you. I'll save you from the hands of the wicked, he says. Now, again, that doesn't mean that God may, you know, allow us to die in persecution. That may happen. But what God does promise is that he will protect us spiritually and uh, preserve us for eternal life in heaven. So we read. You understand, O Lord, remember me and care for me. Avenge me on my persecutors. You are long-suffering. Do not take me away. Think of how I suffer reproach for your sake. When your words came, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight. For I bear your name, O Lord God Almighty. I never sat in the company of revelers, never made merry with them. I sat alone because your hand was on me. You had filled me with indignation. Why is my pain unending and my wound grievous and incurable? Will you be to me like a deceptive brook, like a, a spring that fails? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. If you repent, I will restore you, that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. Don't give in to wickedness. I will make you a wall to this people, a fortified wall of bronze. They will fight against you, will not overcome you, for I am with you to rescue and save, and save you, declares the Lord. I will save you from the hands of the wicked and redeem you from the grasp of the cruel. So here we see love and compassion that he had for Jeremiah. And it's the same love and compassion he has for all of us. Here ends our reading. May the God of peace fill you with love and joy and peace in believing in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in serving Him and in others in love. The words for our meditation this evening are taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 12, beginning with the ninth verse. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. 
Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with God's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So far, our text. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, when it comes to goodness and evil, do you believe that you need both for goodness to stand out? Sort of like the, the nighttime sky and a full moon, and the nighttime sky is that backdrop as the moon shines so brightly in the sky. Francis Bacon, an English philosopher and statesman, once said, in order for the light to shine so brightly, darkness must be present. Hmm. Does God really need to depend upon the darkness of evil and wickedness in order for his love and goodness to be expressed? Some will say that good and evil are inevitable and even necessary in order to get along in life. You know, we all have to survive out there in this world. And so, yeah, you've got to have some kind of wiggle room in order to do the right thing. So if someone wrongs me, I go out and I get revenge and get even so that now they do the right thing. In my eyes. You know, we live in a me, myself, and I society. So many people think the world revolves around them. And it's my way or no way at all. What does Paul say? Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Hmm. Does that really make sense? To a lot of people in this day and age, not really. No. Point is, evil has no place in good. But good is what completely overcomes evil. And so when it comes to God's ways, God's goodness most certainly overcomes evil with love. Now when it comes to God's love, it's more than what most people can handle. Because His love will lead us to come face to face with selflessness and personal sacrifice. Something our sinful nature is not comfortable to compromise with. No way. When we speak about God's love, it's, it's, it's not a romantic love, even though that can be good. Nor is it a love for peanuts, popcorn, and cracker jacks, or pizza, or your favorite pet. No. When we speak about God's love, we're talking about His divine love. And it goes beyond the ideas of fairness and security. 
It involves a sacrifice. A sacrifice that your sinful nature never wants to make in pursuit of self-preservation. I'm number one. I don't care about anybody else in this world unless they can do me a favor. They can help me in life. And here, Paul explains to us what this love looks like in Christian fellowship amongst us brothers and sisters. This kind of love dispels evil, wants nothing to do with it. It works hard to develop good, solid, sound relationships between brothers and sisters in Christ and solidifies and promotes the union that we share with Christ. He says, love must be sincere. Okay, where does sincerity begin? begins in the heart, doesn't it? And as sinners, where can you come up with that sincerity? Certainly not on your own. It comes from God, doesn't it? Yeah. He has worked that love into you as he's brought you into his family through word and sacrament. And so give it all that you've got. To love one another as he has loved you. Hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Hate. We've been told from little on we're never supposed to hate. Jesus says it's okay to hate all evil and wickedness. And then cling to the good. Oh, what's good? A lot of people think good in other ways. Well, you've got the Ten Commandments, the moral law. And in there, God uses it as a guide for you to help and to lead you to show your love for Him by following it because the, the law teaches you right from wrong, doesn't it? Yeah. And then He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Be there for each other. Build each other up. Help each other. Be kind, considerate, good, thoughtful, helpful, loving, forgiving. Honor one another above yourselves. Don't always think of yourself, but think of others ahead of you. As in the case of our Lord, and how he puts us ahead of himself. Never be lacking in zeal. Don't ever give up in doing this. Let God's love shine brightly through you. Keep your spiritual fervor, your desire, your love for Him to keep showing forth every day of your life. Serve the Lord and be joyful in hope. Know that He's always there for you, that He loves you, cares for you, forgives you, is there to help you. Be patient in affliction. Yeah, God can use affliction to certainly strengthen your faith. Faithful in prayer, talk to Him. And share with God's people who are in need. And practice hospitality. In other words, it truly is an honor, a privilege to honor one another above yourselves. And you've got that ability, every one of you here tonight. Because this is what Christ has shown to all of you in bringing about your salvation as God is love. Yes, He is the epitome of what love is. But for us, even as brothers and sisters in Christ, it's not always easy, is it? to love one another. It's tough, it's a struggle sometimes. And we fight like cats and dogs, brothers and sisters. You know, sometimes we may say something nice to a brother or sister, 
and then later on. We may turn right around when they're not around and we're with somebody else and find it so easy to complain, cut them down about something they did. You know, we always seem to find something wrong with everyone instead of speaking well of them. That's frustrating, isn't it? That's our sinful nature. Boy, does it stink to high heaven. That's how Satan and the sinful nature work together. Now, true love is how Christ has loved all of you. His love is genuine, it's fervent, it honors you above himself. And when your words and actions reflect this, we can become a great witness and a source of encouragement to our brothers and sisters in Christ and in bearing one another's burdens. You know, it's like painting a picture, a portrait of Jesus. How well do we paint that portrait of Jesus in the way that we think, speak, and act in our lives? Do we paint this beautiful picture for everybody, showing them what Christ's love and goodness and love and compassion is all about? Or do we Paint a nonchalant picture, like a stick figure. I'll tell you, it's a little of both, isn't it? There are times in your lives where you shine beautifully, in which you say, and then there are times when we mess up. Don't do, don't paint a very good picture of Jesus before others. But you and I know it's hard. It's hard to reflect that love of God. It takes an awful lot of hard work, patience, and prayer to our Lord Jesus to demonstrate his love towards fellow Christians all the time. This is an unending process and will be until we enter heaven. But remember, God is always there to help you, to lead and guide you. And so, how do you overcome evil and wickedness? You do it with love, compassion, goodness, faithfulness, and forgiveness. Now, as hard as it is, even amongst us as fellow Christians, what about the rest of the people out there? Are we to ignore them? And the answer to that is no. Paul tells us how we are to treat those who are outside the Christian faith. And you have to understand, these are people who do not know the love of God as you do. Now granted, they may have been Christians at one time and fallen away, but now they're ignorant to that love. They don't know how to love. They don't know what true love is. They don't see evil and goodness as polar opposites. And because of it, they may not choose. They may not choose to treat you the same way as you would treat them in response to your faith in Christ. And you should expect it. Because they don't know any better. So, what is your response to these people? Well, since they're not in tune with this kind of love, that they're blind to it, they pursue hostility, if they mistreat me, then I have the right to avoid them, right? or seek revenge when this love isn't returned to me. And oftentimes that's speaking of evil. Or maybe it's in the case of uh, 
breaking windows, looting, and burning down buildings, or even taking the lives of others. What does Paul say? Bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. Ooh, wow. That is like a dagger right into the heart. The sinful nature truly hates that. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Do not damn them to hell, speak evil. Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Don't be arrogant. Don't think the world revolves around you or you're better than everybody else in this world. No. We're all sinners. We're all equal. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everybody. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, Live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. And in doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. God is saying, do not repay evil for evil. Now, our sinful nature may think that, well, this isn't fair, this isn't right. No, you got to get back. got to teach them a lesson when they hurt or harm me in some way. No. Let, if somebody has wronged you, go and talk to that person. And hopefully you can settle it. If not, if they wronged you, they broken the law against you, go to the proper authorities. That's what they're there for. And if that doesn't work, then let God deal with it. And he may deal with it in many different ways. Maybe he might give that person a very guilty conscience for what they have done. Or he may deal with them in other ways, maybe with a prison sentence. But whatever we do, do not seek revenge. Now, as I said, our sinful nature doesn't think that's right. But in God's eyes, you know what's right? It's showing love. Because love does not seek fairness. This is the love that is God. It is a love that has saved every one of you here today. I tell you, if God hadn't shown us that love, you and I, we would be no different than the Apostle Paul when he was Saul the persecutor. We'd all hate Christ. We'd all be out there in the mob demonstrations out there. And we'd only care about ourselves and no one else. Christ's love did not seek after fairness. He didn't wipe out all the unbelievers. When he was arrested there in the Garden of Gethsemane, he didn't kill off those soldiers who arrested him. When he was on the cross, ridiculed, persecuted, mocked, he didn't strike them dead. That wasn't even considered. He showed them love. He said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the very love demonstrated in the person of Christ. And the action of responding to evil with good is what will keep burning coals on one's head. Now, I don't want you to go out there and strike up your charcoal grills and, and take these hot coals and, and start putting them on everybody's head. No, 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 no. 
What he's saying is, you who have my love, you can do one better. You can treat them with love and respect. And, you know, sometimes, I'm not saying it's always going to work, but sometimes these people can become best friends with you. Case in point, read an article about Christian or Muslims becoming Christians. And you have to understand their beliefs, it's rather suppressive. There isn't a whole lot of love. And when they begin to hear the word of God and the Spirit works on them, they're just so filled with joy to hear about Christ's love and how he has saved them. But they also say something else. They say that they have never experienced this kind of love in their lives before receiving it from a Christian. That's the love every one of you have here tonight. Don't say you don't, you do. You can make the greatest influence on this world. Rather than demonstrating, right, yet do it with love. The love that Christ has bestowed on you. The love that has forgiven you of all of your sins and even the times you failed to return good for evil. It is the same love that is Jesus' very character and why he responded to the persecution of the world by staying on the cross and allowing evil to destroy him. And the result is he was demonstrating love. As he paid for all of your sins and now provides you with his loving forgiveness, goodness, and blessings in your life. This is how God crushes evil. Love, goodness, kindness. Yes. There is no room for evil in good. No way. And as God's dear children, deeply loved by Him, forgiven. And we know that through word and sacrament. May we go forth and may we paint that beautiful picture of Jesus and let that love of God shine forth from us and show people that evil and good do not coexist, but with goodness, with love, we can overcome evil. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior.
And following our prayer this evening, we will continue at the bottom of page 32, in the front part of your hymnal, page 32, with the praying of the Lord's Prayer in the left hand. Come. Dear God, how many and how great are our transgressions. We must plead guilty to the sins we do every day, sins of thought, word, deed, sins of commission, and sins of neglect. Oh, do not look upon our sins, nor count them against us. Graciously look instead upon your Son's holy blood poured out for us, and grant us cleansing in that sacred blood. Help us believe that in the sacred meal we receive with bread and wine our Savior's very body and blood which were once given and shed for us. May what we are about to receive be to our consciences a comforting seal and a sign of your forgiveness. Help us come to your table confident that we are your sons and daughters through faith in Christ and that we are fellow heirs with him of eternal life. Use this blessed communion with our Savior and our remembering of his death to strengthen our faith and to renew us with renewed vitality with love, goodness, kindness, patience, forgiveness, so as to live our Christian lives. In Jesus' name. And in whose name we also pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We will continue now on the top of page 33. We will read the responses there. We are not going to read the musical portions. We will uh, skip those outside of, uh, yeah, we will skip those this evening. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We will lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ in love. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. And he sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. And now we have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Take eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Take drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for the forgiveness for all of your sins. From here, we have a continuous communion. For those who haven't been here, Okay, there's nobody on my far right hand side, so we will start in the middle. And so couples can come together, come down this aisle, come over, take the bread, take the wine, place the cup in the, in the container there, and then uh, go back down this aisle and then to your pew. Okay. 
Now after this section is done, then this section over here, we start in the back. And you go out, and you will go around through the narthex there, and then down here, and then here, and then go way around, and then back to your seats. Okay. You got that? So, Dina here would be the last one. And we got Dennis and Sue, they would be the first one.
and keep you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Go in peace and joy, knowing that through the love of our Lord Jesus, your sins are forgiven, and that you are and remain his precious children. Go in peace. Amen. Let us arise for prayer. <coughs> Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world. That the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again. And that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live anew in holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace and live in harmony with one another and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated. That concludes our service for this evening. You had a chance to hear the new organ. It still needs to be tweaked. Uh, Val, the one who's been installing it, he will be back on Thursday to do just that. And uh, we're going to turn it up a few notches. Uh, this is where we thought he'd start. And uh, talking to some of the people yesterday, they said it was nice for a small crowd. But when you got more people, you're going to need a little louder. And some people said, you know, I really don't like hearing myself sing. So, <laughs> tune it up, turn it up. So we will do that. And that will help the organist. It gives them a bigger range to work from. You know, some songs are meant to be softer and others are to be louder. So, but, uh, yeah, once it's all uh, fixed up, it's, it's going to be magnificent. Um, it can do so much more. It, it's as good as a, a pipe organ. It's got that many voices to it. It'll sound like a symphony orchestra in time. Um, and, and give our organist a chance. I mean, uh, again, Mary did a fantastic job yesterday for the first time. Um, you know, it, it's like uh, when you're a little kid getting on a two-wheel bike and wondering, okay, okay, you know, can I do this without the training wheels? And uh, she did well. It's a little scary. But uh, as they work with it more and more, they'll get more and more used to it. And it'll sound better and better all the time. So, outside of that, the only thing I have is, uh, again, tomorrow night we have a um, budget meeting. And if anybody is interested uh, in attending and sharing some insight into our budget, you're more than welcome to attend. Um, the other thing is that next Monday is Labor Day. So keep in mind, we do not have Monday night service. Okay? Uh, we will continue on the following Monday, which is the 14th. So, um, so enjoy your Labor Day next uh, Monday. And uh, hopefully we'll see all of you back on Sunday. Because most of the people there are wearing their masks on Sunday. So with that, I wish all of you God's richest blessings, and as you go forth, show the world what true love is all about. Paint that very beautiful portrait of Jesus in your lives with his help, and uh, be there to show that love and kindness, compassion, and forgiveness to one another, as Jesus has shown to all of us.